Good morning. Uh, so this morning I'm going to talk about what God did in my life uh, 12, almost 12 years ago, September 20th, 2009. And it was a shock to me. It still is a shock to me. And um, so, so when I, I grew up in Dallas, Texas in a, in a Roman Catholic family, youngest of eight. Uh, my parents were very busy. And, um, and I, you know, at a very young age, I knew that I was, I probably nine years old, I knew that I was attracted to the same sex, or, or maybe a little bit earlier than that. But it was a weird kind of dynamic. It's a, it's a weird phenomenon when that happens to you, because you don't, it's like, wait, what's, what's going on? Because at that time, in, you know, the 80s, it was very much frowned upon to be gay. Uh, and especially in Dallas and Texas. And so, you know, according to the Catholic Church, according to my friends, according to the culture, being gay was not okay. It was very much stigmatized. So I kind of hid this secret inside for, for many years. And so on the outside, I was, you know, very social and had a lot of friends and went steady with girls, but on the inside I knew something was different about me and I didn't know how to reconcile the two things. And so I just uh, kind of had this double life and it was kind of a schizophrenic life. And so, but it wasn't until high school, I ended up becoming best friends with someone who also was going through the same thing. We came out to each other and we ended up Uh, at, you know, I was 15 years old, 14, 15, and we started going to gay bars in Dallas and to nightclubs. And, you know, my parents didn't really know or they didn't really, they weren't really around that much because there was, there were just too many kids for them to deal with. So they they just let us do our own thing. And I, um, I, I, when I first went to these bars and these clubs, I was like, wow, like these are my people. These are, these people get who I am. They're, they are feeling the same way I do. And I, so I didn't feel so kind of marginalized anymore. I felt like, you know, I was accepted by these people and I was, I was very much embraced by the, by the culture, the gay culture in Dallas. And, but again, at the same time, so I, my friend, my best friend and I, we would go to, you know, all these different dances, like debutante balls and proms and this and that. But then after the night ended, we would sneak off at midnight and go to gay bars until like four in the morning. And so, again, it was like this crazy double life I was leading. And my parents were completely oblivious to it, I think. Um, My dad may have had some sort of suspicions. But, and then the same thing happened in college. I became best friends with someone who was dealing with the same thing. At that time, I was still, I didn't identify as gay. Uh, I, I just thought like, this, was, this is kind of a phase I'm going through and this will pass. Like I, I am attracted to the same sex, but you know, eventually I'll get married to a woman and have a family. But it was just like, it was kind of like, you know, when you're that young, you just live in the moment. You just live in the present. And, so I didn't really think about the future that much, and I just was like, well, this is how I'm feeling now, and I'm pursuing this. And, and so I, in college, you know, same thing, went to gay bars with my, my best friend, still closeted, didn't tell anyone. And then after college, I moved to Tokyo with my best friend. And uh, it's weird, because in Tokyo, that's where I really, that's where, homosexuality became my identity, which is a, an odd place to be when, you're, when that becomes your identity in, in Japan. Uh, but because, the reason that happened is because my, my best, my friend who I lived with in this tiny Japanese apartment, which is the size of the stage, like smaller than the stage, um, he, invited, he had invited his, his really close friend from Texas to, to come visit us. And so his friend came to our apartment, and then a few days later, it was like, wow, I'm in love. And it was like this, uh, I fell in love for the first time in my life, and it was like, okay, now I can 
tell everyone. Because that's when, that's when homosexual, homosexuality as my identity became completely cemented. And it was weird because it, it empowered me, that kind of, that relationship empowered me to, to, to come out. And I told all my friends, I told my, you know, my family, and so my, my sister actually ended up telling my family before I got home from Tokyo. But so um, by the time I got back to Dallas, after a year of being in Japan, my parents knew, and they were, they were really sweet about it. And um, they, <laughs> they were, my mother cried, and I, you know, she, and she was like, I heard you're homosexual, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Mom, it's okay. This is, it's not a big deal. I tried to just kind of play it down with her. And we were, my mother and I were very, very close. She's with Jesus right now, which is amazing. And so is my father. Um, and, and then my dad came up to me the next day and he said, hey, Beck, are you, I heard you're homosexual, or I don't know how he phrased it, like, I heard you're gay. Um, you know, did I do anything as a father? Am I, like, was, are you angry at me for this and that? And or, I was like, dad, dad, no, no, no. Like, I, this is who I am. It's not a big deal. It's not your fault. And, and again, I just tried to sort of, it was a really awkward kind of encounter <laughs> with my dad. Because <laughs> my dad was such a man's man. It was just weird to like talk to him about this. So I was like, no, dad, it's okay. Don't worry about me. And, and then I, you know, I was pre-med in college, but didn't want to be a doctor. At the end of it, I realized I didn't want to be a physician. And so I kind of, I had, I applied to, I was in de enrolled in dental school and law school in Dallas, at SMU Law School and Baylor Dental School. And, uh, but it just has kind of backup plans because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then um, before school started, but both schools, like two weeks before both schools started, I was like, hey, Dad, um, I'm going to move to L.A. instead and not do any of that. And uh, he was like, what? He was so confused by that. And so I, I loaded up my, my car and drove to Los Angeles in 19, it was June of 1993. Drove straight through, didn't stop. I mean, didn't uh, we stopped for gas, but I didn't. Uh, I actually drove, it's weird, I drove with that guy from Tokyo. Um, and so when I got to LA, I already had this whole group of friends in place because a lot, all of my friends from high school, after college, they moved to either New York or LA. And so I, so I had this whole group of friends from high school who lived in LA. And they were all just, you know, really, smart and funny and fun and, and ambitious, very ambitious. And in fact, like uh, a lot of this content you may or may not see on TV is created by my friends <laughs> who, who now run Hollywood. And um, so for, the, for years, I lived this kind of like this life in LA, which was really fun and exciting. And I, I you know, went to all the, I did all the stuff. Like, I went to all the movie premieres, the Golden Globes, the Oscars, the Emmys, the, the Grammys. Like, I went to all the after parties. I met everyone. I knew everyone. Um, I was friends with a lot of movie stars and, and, and uh, TV stars and uh, directors and writers. And, and I, um, I ended up becoming a production designer, a set designer in L.A., uh, doing fashion shoots for Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and, and, and Gap and Nike and all these other brands. And I did that. That's what I ended up doing for years uh, after I kind of did some acting and writing. But, um, and then, and, and over the years, you know, I, in L.A., I, what, I, had, I, was, we, I was having a blast. Like, I, my friends and I, we all wanted the same things. We all wanted to make it big in Hollywood. We all wanted to have, uh, find true love. When I went through, a, I went through a, many boyfriends, like five boyfriends, and they were all very intense relationships and very, um, it's so interesting, because like when, 
the, the relationships kind of like, this is, a, this is maybe controversial to say, but in, in gay male relationships and even lesbian relationships, it's like they live, they kind of occupy this like neurotic space. It's like a weird kind of uh, dysfunction in the relationship, which we, I'm going to maybe get into more tonight. But so I, I cycled through five serious relationships over the years. And, you know, I was in relationships. I was pursuing career stuff, which was fun. I was, you know, having so much fun going to these, all these parties and meeting everyone and going to dinners and uh, having dinner with Tom Hanks and Meryl Streep and going to Prince's house for a concert in his backyard. And just like all these things just were constantly happening. And, and I thought, okay, this is, and my friends never, God was never an option. Like evangelical Christians were the enemy to us. Literally, like we, evangelical Christians were, we, we, yeah, we looked at <laughs> with scorn on, <laughs> on evangelicals. And uh, God was never an option because, I mean, we, we just, first of all, because I was gay, but also all of my friends, we just assumed that God didn't exist and that the whole, the Bible was an ancient myth, like any other ancient myth. Uh, and, and so we, I, I literally never discussed God. It just never, the word God never came up in conversation. We never once asked each other, hey, you know, do you believe in God? It was just, you know, like, God doesn't exist. And this is on, like, some, some thing I just recently watched. It's like, this, the, the character says, yeah, there's no God. We just, we're just in rooms trying to be happy. And, like, that's kind of, like, what it was. It was like, there's no God, so let's just, like, make the best of it now. Like, let's do, have all these great experiences, do all this fun stuff, travel the, I traveled the world, I, I went everywhere, and um, so I thought, okay, this is what life is all about, really having these experiences and knowing yourself, and, and then, <clears throat> and then after years of that, it started to become a little less exciting, and I started to wonder, is that all there is? Is that all there is to a fire? Is that all there is? Peggy Lee. And so I just, I, I, the law of diminishing returns started to set in. And I was like, okay, this is all kind of fun and I've had a blast and I've done really extraordinary things. And, but uh, wh where, what's the meaning of life and what am I gonna do with my life? Uh, like what, what ultimate, what's my telos? What's my purpose in life, really? Like what's the goal? And um, that started to sort of haunt me. And, and then it all came to a head in P Paris Fashion Week. During Paris Fashion Week, I used to go to Fashion Week in New York and Paris a lot because my friends were all in the fashion business and um, or in, the, in, the, in that world. And so <clears throat> I was always invited every year, every season I was invited to, to Fashion Week. And so I was in Paris Fashion Week, March of 2009. And <clears throat> I went to, you know, a bunch of the runway shows, to the after parties. There's always these after parties after the shows. And I, I, at this one night, at one night at this party, it was Stella McCartney's party, her after party, and I just, I was sitting up on this like deck overlooking the, the dance floor at this club, it was at a club in, called Regine in the middle of Paris, and I was sitting on this deck with a few people drinking champagne, and everyone on the dance, everyone was there, just Kanye West was there, like the whole, everyone was dancing, like having the times of their lives, allegedly. And, <laughs> and so, I, but I just suddenly felt this overwhelming kind of emptiness, and I was like, whoa, like what's happening? And I just felt, in that moment, I felt like this, I can't do this anymore, like I can't just live this life, I can't just keep going to dinner parties and, you know, having, these conversa these horizontal conversations that like kind of don't go anywhere and and so 
I was in a panic and I went back, I just ghosted the party. I went back to my hotel, or my apartment that I rented and I was up all night in a panic about my future. And I was like, what am I gonna do for the rest of my life? Like, I can't be a Christian because I'm gay because my family members were all amazing believers, I, which is crazy. My, every, all of my siblings and my parents are bo like born again believers and I was like 10 people in my family. It's crazy. God had amazing grace on my family. But um, so I was like, I can't be a Christian. That's off the table. What am I going to do? Am I going to like move to Palm Springs and be put out to pastor? Because, you know, you age out as a gay man, you sort of age out of L.A. at a certain point, and you just have to move to Palm Springs <laughs> and just, like, retire or something there. And so I, <laughs> I uh, was up, up all night in a panic about my life and the future. And then I got back to L.A. a couple days later, got busy with work, and, and, and production design is so, it's so stressful, it, it, it takes up, it consumes you. It takes up all of your thought life and energy. And so I, I kind of forgot about that night in Paris. And then six months later, I was at a coffee, six months later, I was at a, a coffee shop in L.A. with my best friend. And we noticed, the, we, we noticed this guy came out of the coffee shop out onto the patio and he had a, a, a big book and it said Romans on the spine. And I, so I knew enough about religion that it was a religious book. Uh, and so my friend and I were like, what's going on with this guy? This is weird. Because we had never seen religious books in, in public in LA. We'd never seen the Bible in public. And then he walks to a table next to us and talks to them and it's a, a bunch of young people, and they all have physical Bibles, like, on the table. And, which I, we were just shocked. My friend and I, it was seriously, like, a shocking moment. We were like, whoa, this is crazy. I mean, it was in a part of L.A. that's, like, super progressive, and you would never see that kind of thing. Um, and so we, we were intrigued, half intrigued, half kind of disturbed by it, but... I was really kind of intrigued because I had, because I was wrestling with like, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? I don't, and so I, my friend was like, talk to them, like ask them what they're doing. And, and I was like, no, because he liked to stir up conversation. He liked to stir up trouble, basically. <laughs> and um, so I was like, no. I, and then finally I turned to them and it's like, you know, a Christian's fantasy come true. I turned to these Christians and I'm like, hey, I'm an atheist. Uh, what are, are you guys Christians and what do you believe? What's the gospel? And they were happy to tell me. Um, <laughs> so they, <laughs> I said, you know, I grew up Roman Catholic. I don't really, I, I remember what, I don't know anything. Like just explain to me what you believe. And, and they, they said they went to an evangelical church in Hollywood called Reality LA. And I, uh, and, and they told me the gospel, basically. And I, you know, and we talked for a long time. And they were very, very sweet. And, and of course, I get to the $64,000 question. And I said, well, what does your church in Hollywood believe about homosexuality? And they said, well, we believe it's a sin. And it was just like they were so blunt about it and so frank about it. And I, I appreciated that. I appreciated that they were so clear about it, that it wasn't some, they, they didn't try to dodge the question. Um, and I said, and, and, and in that moment, the reason I didn't freak out on them is because of that night in Paris six months before. And in that moment, I had this kind of flash of like, okay, there's a slim chance that God exists, tiny chance. It, it could, there's a possibility uh, and if he does exist, homosexual behavior could be a sin. Is it could be a sin? And what if I've built my entire life on this false foundation and I don't know it? And so they invited me to their church the following Sunday. My friend was just kind of in the background, like he he's a voyeur, so he didn't really <laughs> participate in the conversation. He just listened. And but they just invited me and said, you know, come to church next Sunday. And I was like. 
well, I don't know about that. That was, that was like a big step. And so they gave me the address of the church and I had a whole week to think about, think about it. And I, I did, I really thought about it. I, you know, I was like, am I gonna do this? This is weird. I'm betraying my people if I go. Like if my friends find out that I went to an evangelical church, they're gonna think I'm crazy. And so the next Sunday, comes around and I wake up and I'm like, I guess I'm going to church today. And I didn't know why. And I just like, my, it was felt like I was in a Tesla and it just drove me to the church, like without me driving. It was like, <laughs> like God was just pulling me to this, to this church. And, or to, and so it meets in a high school auditorium and I had never been to an evangelical church before. I didn't know what it was like. I didn't know what it looked like. I was used to stained glass windows and smoke and, and you know, candles, investments and hats and stuff. So I, I wasn't, I was used to like a lot of theater, you know, church. So I, I um, didn't know what to expect. And I walk up and, and I, the first thing that happens is this woman says, hi, welcome, we love you. And I was like, what? Me? <laughs> and I was like, this is weird. Okay. And so I went in and the worship music was playing when I walked in. The lights were dim and the worship band was playing and, and I was like, oh, Christian music. I forgot that existed. This is weird. And then I was like, wait, it's actually not bad. I, it's very nice and tasteful and beautiful. And it, it was. And, and um, so I sat down in the front by myself the pastor comes out and he starts preaching on Romans chapter seven. He was in a whole series on Romans for two years. And he's preaching on Romans. And as he's preaching for an hour, I'm just like riveted to the sermon because everything he's saying, every word that's coming out of his mouth is resonating as truth in my mind, in my heart. And I didn't know why. I was like, what is happening here? This is, and it was the first time I had ever heard the gospel and understood it for the, it was, for the first time in my life, it was like, this is the gospel? This is good news, this is crazy. Like, I, it turned everything I knew about religion on its head. And I was just blown away by it, and it was like piercing me. And after the sermon, he, le he said, you know, there's people on the sides that can pray for you, and if you want prayer, and then there's another 30 minutes of worship music and the lights dim. So he left the stage again, and I went over to this guy on the side to get, and I was like, hey, and again, it's a Christian's fantasy come true. I, I went up to him and I said, hey, I don't know what I believe, but I'm here. And he said, okay, let me pray for you. And he laid hands on me when that was still legal in California. And he <laughs> prayed for me. <laughs> he prayed, and it was so powerful and so loving, and I was just like, why does this random straight dude love me so much? And so I, went, I thanked him, I went back to my seat, and I, as soon as I sat, everyone else was standing and singing and, and, and worshiping. I sat down, because I was just like too freaked out, and I just sat, but the second I sat down, the Holy Spirit was like, like just flooded me, and it was like God in that moment, it was like a road to Damascus kind of encounter with God and Jesus. And in that moment, God said, God said, I'm God, Jesus is my son, heaven is real, hell is real, the Bible is true, welcome to my kingdom. <laughs> and I was just like, whoa! And I just was, and I started crying. Like, I was crying harder than I had ever cried in my life. Like, an, I was crying like an infant, which makes sense because I was just born again. <laughs> in that moment, <laughs> and I was just like, I was crying, I was convicted of, of sin, I was crying over my sin, but also crying over, I was so joyful that I had just met the king of the universe, Jesus, and that uh, I finally knew the meaning of life, and I was like, whoa, this is insane, it, I can't believe this is true, <clears throat> and it, it was so clear, God had so much, it was so cool that God did that to me on the first day, the first time I went into a church, like he was like, okay, <laughs> this is gonna, he's like, this is, I'm gonna show you who I am and it's gonna be so clear that it's gonna be undeniable. It was like, it was like Paul when he's like caught up in the third heaven. It was like kind of like that moment and it was like, 
I almost, it was like a near-death experience. I didn't, when I, after that moment, I was like, I just want to go to heaven. I don't even want to be on this planet anymore. And, um, and then I got home, and it happened again. God was like, let me show you some more of my glory. And he flooded me, and I just started bawling again in my bedroom, and I jumped up out of my bed because I was trying to take a nap. And I jumped up, and I was like, God, you have my whole life. I'm yours, I am done, like I'm done. And I knew in that moment that homosexual behavior was a sin. I knew that it was no longer my identity, that it was my old man, and that I knew that, that dating guys was not a part of my future anymore, but I didn't care because I had just met Jesus. And I was like, I'm gonna go with this guy. Forget those guys. This guy's way better. He's, he'll never leave or forsake me. He's always faithful, he'll never, cheat on me. Um, and so that was September 20th, 2009 at 2 p.m. And I am still in awe of God's mercy on me because, I, and, and of course, I, you know, I had to tell all my friends afterwards, which, which was insane. And it took me three weeks to, to, to sit everyone down and talk to them and explain. And <clears throat> they were like, I was like, I have, I have the craziest thing to tell you. And they're like, what, did you, are you moving? Did you, are you, did you meet a new guy? I'm like, well, yeah, kinda. <laughs> His name is Jesus. Um, and they were like, what? My friends were just stunned by it. Like they hadn't, uh, it was the most bizarre thing for them to ever hear. And one of my friends asked me, she was pretty, you know, she was very astute. She's very smart and she, I told her my whole story, and I told her that, you know, the, whole, I, the Holy Spirit dwells in me, and I'm, you know, I have assurance of my salvation and all this stuff. And, and she said, okay, well, let me ask you a question. So if you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and then why can't you now go and start dating a guy? And I'm like, and I said, well, and I, and I kind of, these are some verses that came up, and this, and 2 Corinthians, these are all Pauline, these are all Paul's verses, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And then Paul goes on in Colossians chapter 3, and he says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. So that old man, that old self of my, me died when I, that, I, I was, cruci that was crucified. And I was a new creation. And then in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, how can we who die to sin still live in it? And, and, and in 1 John chapter 3, <clears throat> this is kind of a, chapter 3 verse 6 through 9, this is kind of a long passage. <clears throat> uh, John says, the, the Apostle John says, No one who abides in him, in God, keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a, a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God, born again, born from above. And finally, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27, he says, uh, the writer of, the Hebrews, of Hebrews says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So that's kind of how I was explained it to her. I was like, I, you, you, you can't, you can't, go on being disobedient to God after you are born again. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't fit. And, and she didn't, 
She didn't really grasp that or, or believe that. <laughs> I'm still praying for Stephanie. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people ask me, well, I'll, 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 my friends and, because I told, I told my friends, you know, I'm going to be single and celibate for the rest of my life. Like, unless God does some, you know, crazy thing and makes me attracted to a woman, like, I'm going to be single and celibate. And they're like, but isn't that unfair? Like, what, that's, that's so, uh, that, that doesn't, don't you feel cheated out of, like, a relationship? And I'm like, first of all, I'm in the most amazing relationship in the universe with the king of the universe. And I never, ever, not once in the last 12 years have I ever felt cheated or like life is unfair. What's unfair is Jesus had to be brutally beaten, tortured, and crucified for my sins. That's unfair. Like the fact that he redeemed me and I have eternal life now and I'm in the kingdom of God, I feel like the luckiest guy in the world. Like I feel like nothing is, is uh, unfair in my life. I never, I never feel... And I, know this is, and I know this is not the experience of everyone who deals with this situation, but I never feel lonely because I have this intimate, intimate relationship with Christ. And it's so powerful. It's like, I could just like be on a, a move to an island. I mean, not that it's not biblical to do that. Or, well, John did. He moved to Patmos and he wrote, he was like tanning and writing Revelation at the same time. <laughs> Um, but, like, I don't, like, it's like, I have, the, my relationship with Christ is so intense and powerful and amazing that I don't, I don't, I don't long for, I never, I don't desire to go back to Egypt. I don't want to go back into bondage. I thought I was, in, I was thought for 20 years, I thought I was sexually liberated. Being a gay man in, in Hollywood, I was in bondage. I was in, I was in bondage. And now I'm truly liberated in Christ. I'm truly free in Christ. And uh, there's a story that you guys are familiar with, uh, <clears throat> probably, in, in the Gospels, the rich young man or the rich young ruler. And this is in Mark chapter 10. And I'll just quickly go through this because we're almost out of time. But Remember, if you just turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 22, um, this rich guy comes up to Jesus, right? And he's like, he says, he, 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 the, he ran up to Jesus and knelt before him and he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Do you know the commandments? Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, I, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looking at him, loved him. And he said to him, you lack one thing, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by, this, by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And that passage, so Jesus knew what the functioning idol was in this guy's life. The functioning idol was possessions, was money, right? And Jesus puts his finger on that, that idol. He's like, okay, go sell all your stuff and come follow me. And, he's, and that was the deal breaker for this guy, for the rich young man. It, that was the deal breaker to follow Christ. And can you imagine, like, having Christ in the flesh, Jesus in the flesh, asking you to follow him and just turning away and saying, mm, no, I'm going to go for that. I'm going to go for back to my money. And that's the same thing. And I felt the same way as a gay man. Like, in the gay community, that's the same thing. And I just see that all the time. I... Um, and it's, it, this is the deal breaker. Like, the, the, the identity of being gay is the deal breaker for coming to Christ. And I, and I, I had a friend who I, I ran into. 
He came to, I invited, he's, he's, he's gay, and I invited, he came to my church one time, and, uh, and then he didn't come back, and I, I ran into him later, a few, a couple months later, and I said, hey, like, what, what happened? Why aren't you coming back? And, and it was because of this issue, because he was gay, and he's like, I just can't, and, and I was like, Scott, like, this is the most important thing in the entire world, like, we were born, we were created to be in relationship with the Father, and the only way we can do that is through Christ, his Son, and, and trusting in his Son and putting our faith in him, and he just was so rattled. When I, I told him like this, I was like, Scott, please, like, don't, and he had, you know, he had a boyfriend who was like, a, he's a, his boyfriend, or his husband, actually, is a major, very successful TV writer in Hollywood, so it's like he would have to not only give up being gay, but also give up this, like, really fancy life he lives. And he wasn't willing to do that. And that's what, to me, is so sad, because it's like, it's like the rich young man. He just, it's like, no, this is, I, I can't follow you, Jesus, because I, I want this other stuff now. I want, I, want, I want this temporary satisfaction in this life now. I don't, I don't want it to kind of wait for the promises of God, like that. That's too far. That's too far in the future. I have to live my life now and be satisfied and satisfy all my appetites, <clears throat> just like Esau did when he sold his birthright for a single meal. So we're out of time. Um, I think I. The one thing I will. Oh, I, the one last thing I, I do want to say is this. This verse. I want to just read this verse from Matthew chapter seven. Because this kind of says it all, um, and it's so powerful. Matthew chapter 7, 13 through 14, is Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it by it are many, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So that's really powerful stuff. And so, enter by the narrow gate. So I'm going to pray for us. Um, thank you, Lord, so much for this time. Thank you for your mercy, your salvation. Thank you for just all that you've done in our lives, Lord. And it just, the salvation itself is a total miracle. It's everyone in this room who, who is saved is it's a miraculous thing it's a supernatural miraculous thing and so god i thank you so much for that um i just pray for anyone in here who doesn't know you or who is even struggling with this issue that you would just minister to them that you would um just like you did to me that day when i was in church that you would just show them who you are that you that the gospel would just pierce them lord and they, they would come to you in faith and have everlasting life. So, Lord, we just love you, we bless you, and we just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.